All right, take your Bibles and turn with me to John 10. I have a, a huge announcement this morning. And uh, again, if you're visiting with us, please give me an allowance for this. I'm going to spend some time with this um, to try to explain to our church where we are and, and what's happened and how God has led. Um, John chapter 10, if you would please. <clears throat> In John 10, our, our Lord, um, we, we, we know this as the Good Shepherd passage, of course. If um, you'll take um, just a moment, we'll go there. And it says in verse um, number 7, the end of verse number 7, I am the door of the sheep. Verse number 9, I am the door. Verse number 11, I am the good shepherd. And he gave us his life for the sheep. And as we continue down verse 14, I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and have known of my... Isn't that, isn't that a wonderful truth? Amen. That the Lord knows us. Amen. Amen. Um, as the Father knoweth me, even so I know the Father... And I lay down my life for the sheep. Now, <clears throat> in this context, we are now about to have an amazing truth revealed to us. He then says, and other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring and they shall hear my voice, and they shall be, what? One. one fold and one shepherd. And what we have a reference to here, actually, is when the Lord is talking about his sheep, he's talking about the Jews, the Jewish people, those that are following him. That's who he's ministering to. But then he said, I have other sheep. Who is the other sheep? Well, he's talking about the Gentile world. The fact that uh, the Lord Jesus uh, came not simply to die for the Jew, but to die for the Gentile also. When we go to the beginning of the book of Romans, again and again, we find there that the gospel was given to the Jew and to the Gentile. In this particular passage, do you realize that we're the other sheep in the passage? But can I say to you, there's a whole lot of other sheep. Uh, I, I want uh, to put a picture up here of our town, of our area. Uh, this is our Winchester. Okay, this is the, the city proper, and of course, we affect Frederick County. Uh, we affect um, the edges of uh, West uh, Virginia. Uh, well, we affect actually more than that regularly. We have a lot of people that listen online. Um, uh, I had a man that just made me laugh. It was this morning, actually. He said, Preacher, I think I'm going to listen to you this morning, but I want you to know I'm sitting in my church, and I have my phone on, I have an earplug in, and I'm in my church, but I think I'm going to listen to you. <laughs> and he said, my, my only problem with that is I'm afraid I'm going to say amen at the wrong time. <laughs> yeah, I did the same thing. You really had me laughing. Uh, <clears throat> For a long time, um, I have had a burden about an area of ministry, and um, we have actually tried to start this ministry twice. Um, we see all around us. I was at Costco yesterday, and as I looked around, 20%, at least 20% of the people in Costco were Spanish-speaking. 20%. A few years ago, uh, we had, um, in a census, that 19%, 19% of Winchester City is Hispanic. 
12% of Frederick County. I have estimates from a man I'm going to introduce to you just in a moment that in our area easily we have between 25,000 and 35,000, maybe more. Actually, if you reach out a little farther, maybe closer to 40,000 people that speak some type, or we would consider Spanish. Let me just share with you a journey that, that I have been on. I want to put a missionary up here that we support. Many of you know um, Brother um, Dewey Whitfield. We've supported him now for a couple of years. If I go to my cell phone and I go back to our conversations, it would have been 2021 on my cell phone that I begin to ask him, is there anybody that you know of that would be burdened to come and uh, to use of the Lord to be able to start a Spanish-speaking ministry in our church? I'm burdened about that. That was in 2021. He found a man, and in my conversations with that man, a good man, actually a, a professor, I just, I just didn't have, did not have liberty at all uh, to bring that man on, and I could be more specific, but I don't want this to get longer uh, than, than what it already is going to be. And so I've asked Brother, Br Brother Whitfield about this, and um, uh, probably about eight months ago, um, we began to talk more serious about this in our area. And um, he has spent time from Hagerstown to Harrisonburg. And if you know anything about the Harrisonburg, Edinburgh area, um, you have um, a lot of Hispanic people coming in there working in jobs like the chicken factories, et cetera, and they're huge. They're momentous. And so in this corridor, uh, we have literally, the word is an explosion of Spanish ministry and growth in families. Um, that's just, actu actually it's astounding um, how much it is. Um, most of the time, if you're going to have a work crew, whether it's roof or yard or whatever, you're going to find that um, there are some type of Spanish people, pe people there involved. Uh, how many of you ever go, and we use the phrase, we should, maybe we do, we're going to go eat Mexican. How many of you ever do that? Yeah, come on, the rest of you. Uh, we, we, we have this influence all around us. And so the, the burden for this has grown in my heart over a period of time. And um, several months ago, um, he came to me and said, I, I'm, I'm really burdened. He has planted six uh, Spanish-speaking churches in America in 21 years. He said, I'm really burdened for the valley. And he said, Pastor, I'd, I'd like to plant two churches. Um, at the same time, if I could, if God would allow that in the valley. And so in February of this year, he came to me and uh, we were talking and he said, would you pray with me for a month and let's meet in March about the possibility of two churches here. And I did that and he met with me and uh, this is what he shared. Um, valley Baptist Church in Edinburgh. If you're familiar with that assembly, that used to be Jim Bailey's church, um, has a Spanish ministry that just started because those folks started coming um, to the church just looking for something. And uh, <clears throat> they've had that ministry going now for a good while. And... Um, They'll, they'll average, in all honesty, anywhere from 10 to 20 people is what they'll average faithfully. They had a funeral uh, for an Hispanic man. They had 160 people show up down there, and he preached that funeral. So in two weeks, him and his wife moved to Edinburgh, um, and uh, they're, they are living there. 
um, in a pool behind trailer, about 40 foot trailer. They're hooking up with electric water sewer. They've taken a garage down there. That, that's a big f facility down there. And they've turned the garage into a study for him. That is set. He's starting it in two weeks. That ministry is, is gone. He then, as we sat down, said, Pastor, the second church I would like to start is here in Winchester. And I'm wondering, would you be willing to be the church um, that would birth a Spanish ministry? And uh, something I've thought about, prayed about, I said, absolutely I would. And so we've begun those plans uh, to start that work here in Winchester. Um, his heart is to allow that work down there to be able to come up and help minister here in Winchester. What we're looking at, as God allows, as I'm sharing this with you, is sometime in the fall, uh, beginning um, uh, services here. Those services would be complimentary. They would be an early service down there and an afternoon service up here at Emmanuel. Um, following that meeting and that time together, I spent time in prayer. I then met with our deacons and shared that with them. I followed that up by having Brother Whitfield meet with the deacons and myself and uh, Pastor Luke here at the church and allowed him to share his ministry. They talked with him, they asked questions, and I asked them to spend some time in prayer, and I'm now coming to you after all those steps because they feel unanimously that this is something that we need to pursue as a church. Um, a little further explanation, if I can. Um, that brother is fully supported. Um, which means that he has a place to live and stay. We are obviously going to be involved in, in helping him and providing for him, but it's not going to be the salary that it would be, uh, that, that necessarily that salary, if we were taking on another full-time pastor. What he is going to be is a, a missionary church planter uh, interacting with both of our assemblies. Um, the church in Edinburgh is very happy and satisfied with this. I've sat down with him. We've had discussions about doctrine and what we believe. We've had discussions about the border. Uh, we've had discussions um, uh, uh, about support, about time. He assumes that it would take five to seven years to be able to get the church planted here, settled uh, enough that down the road then Emmanuel could call its own pastor. And I'm going to be very clear. We're not talking about starting a, its own Spanish work. We're talking about this being an actual part of Emmanuel Baptist Church. Okay. Um, I have uh, met with, obviously Don and I have met with him and his wife and we have spent time together. Uh, folks, and so in every, I've asked God to confirm this again and again, and uh, the Lord has done that. So, um, what I'm doing today is I'm presenting this to you, and I'm asking you to pray about it. I'm asking you to see the need in our area for this kind of ministry. I know there'll be a lot of questions, etc. I've asked him to come and in several weeks, he is going to be here at Emmanuel, and he is going to share with you his heart and how this happened, how God developed this in his heart, why he believes he needs to be here. Uh, the idea of him being Edinburgh is done, settled, it's over. That, that, that's happening. Okay? He further would like to see, as two churches are planted, that he would actually like to see maybe a Spanish Bible Institute started where men could be trained here in the area. We're sort of just allowing God to lead in that. So uh, I, am, I am tremendously thrilled and excited about this. It, it's a huge opportunity for our assembly. Um, it... Um, I believe, uh, of course, 
It's going to have assets and liabilities, like starting any ministry. This is the biggest ministry step we've taken since we started RU um, here at the church. Okay? So be prayerful with me about this. I know it's a lot to take in uh, as, as we consider um, this ministry. I know that you'll have some more questions, but pray with me about that. I come back to this passage here in John um, verse number 16, other sheep I have. All around you, you have Spanish-speaking people that live across from you, that you work with. Wouldn't it be a blessing to have some of them that have trusted Christ because of this ministry? Okay? So, uh, Lord, you take uh, the presentation, the time, the conversation, the burden, and Lord, you use it in our lives as you see fit. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, okay. Let's uh, now um, change gears, and I'm going to try to have a shortened message. Yeah, good luck with that one, okay? And uh, I want you to take um, your Bibles, as it were, and uh, let's go to Romans chapter number 5. I want to preach to us today in victory, victory in your Christian life. Now, <clears throat> I have been, I think, and thank you for the wonderful comments on the study of Leviticus. I know that's been very heavy. It's been a lot of heavy material. Today, um, I'm going to share aspects about our Christian faith, but I want to share one major truth that's going to help you to have victory in your Christian life. Okay? So notice, I'm going to move through the points fairly quickly, but notice if you would please, uh, the book of Romans chapter number 5 there. And uh, notice, if you would, please, uh, verse number 8. But God commended that His love toward us, and that while we were yet, what? Sinners. Sinners. Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified, that's made righteous by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. Lord, we ask Your blessing upon the Word of God. Use it in Your name. Amen. Um, I want to just for a moment use marriage as an illustration. Uh, marriage, uh, if you would, if I'm trying to define that, um, I have a, 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 a city definition and a country definition, all right? Uh, the city def de de definition, maybe a little bit heavier, would say that marriage is an irreplaceable and core institution of human society created by God before the fall of Adam and Eve, which communicates spiritual truth about the human race, about relationships. A marriage is a picture of Christ and His church. Now the country definition would be this. Marriage is two people, a man and a woman, committing themselves together in the will of God for a lifetime. Marriage is a man and a woman committing themselves together in the will of God for a lifetime. So let's talk about that. Um, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna bring together two couples. They just get married. We're going to think about marriage. What does it involve? Well, of course, the husband and wife, that relationship, it involves a home, a purchasing a home, maybe setting up a home, purchasing a house. It involves jobs. It involves sharing of needs. It involves meals. It involves time. It involves togetherness. It involves family. It involves children. It involves neighborhood. It involves life. Let's, let's take this and say, one day there's a couple, they get married, 
And uh, this is their first day where the husband is going out and working. He's out and working. He's coming home. Um, he's tired. It's his first day at work. Uh, the wife has been out in the yard, and she's been doing some yard work and planting some flowers, etc. And they both get into the house. They're having conversations. It's about supper time, and they both look at each other, and they both say at the time, same time, so where's supper? You know, he's like, and she's like, where's supper? Well, you would assume that with the marriage, they would understand that between the two of them, they have supper responsibilities, wouldn't you? There's provision for that in the marriage. Let's, let, let's just take it a, a step further, being a little facetious here, that, that same couple... Um, she's expecting, they have their baby, they bring it home the first day, they're home in the house, and they both look at each other and say, well, who's taking care of him? <laughs> okay? Again, with marriage comes that supposing that that, that, that kind of thing's going to be taken care of. Um, with marriage, we would assume that we do the phrase, when a couple gets married, okay, uh, we're, we're, we're getting married, and what, till death do us part. We have these phrases in there, uh, in sickness and in health. That's part of marriage. Well, <clears throat> can I suggest to you today that it seems in our Christian lives, in our marriage with Christ, in our relationship with Jesus Christ, after we're saved, we're living in that relationship, and some of the basics that ought to be taken care of, we seem to be struggling with. Like meals, who's going to take care of the children, sickness and health. What I'm saying is this, is that many Christians seem to be struggling with some basic aspects of our Christian life, indeed failing. And you're failing with your mouth, you're failing with your mind, you're failing in your motives, you're failing in ministry, you're failing in money. And it seems like here we are, we're, we're saved, but we're, all we do is hold on. Because it seems like we have no offensiveness, and I mean offense, in our Christian life, joy only comes to us occasionally, and it's like we want to sing, and by the way, we don't sing this song at Emmanuel, and Pastor Luke knows that. Okay, hold the fort, for I am coming. Okay, because that seems to be what we're doing. We're just going to hold the fort. Okay, while well, things are so bad, Jesus is soon coming. Okay, did you see Iran just attack Israel? It's the end. That's it. We're, we're, we're done. Well, maybe not. We could be here a while yet. You know, it was like, oh, look, 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 look what's happening with the eclipse. All kinds of bad and terrible things are going to happen. Okay. <clears throat> maybe, not, maybe not quite. Um, but, but here we are, and I guess what I'm saying is we seem to be missing something in, in our Christianity. And, 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 we, and we seem to be living so often without victory. And it seems like when we have victory, it comes from the fact of our determination, because I'm just going to push through, and I'm just going to do it. Okay, and that ends up, even though that might be good flash reasoning, it's still flash reasoning. And so, where is this victory? A couple of areas, if you would. Um, I need victory in my sanctification. That is my walk with Christ. That's going to bring change in all areas. Sanctifying me, holiness of mind and of body and of walk. I need help with my service. I don't know about you. God said I am to be, I am to be full of good works. Are you? Where is your imprint, Mr.? Where now is your imprint, your hand of service or involvement at Emmanuel Baptist Church? Preacher, I'm just uncomfortable you asking me that. Well, better me ask you that than Jesus ask you that one day. I mean, are you here? Are you part of this church? <clears throat> Next, when it comes to shepherding, 
The shepherding. I'm interacting with God and there has to be shepherding. That's of me. I need the encouragements from God. Do you? I need comfort from the Lord as I walk with Him through this world. I need consolation. Soul winning. I, I, I need power. I need a burden for lost people. Um, the, the ministry that we're just talking about. Where is that going to go? Where is it going to come from? Are we going to be burdened for it? What are we going to do with that opportunity? Oh, and by the way, some church in Winchester, uh, um, the Baptist church, independent fundamental church is going to start a Spanish ministry. There is none. You realize that? Up and down the valley. It's time somebody starts one. Amen. Instead of complaining about all these people that we see around us. By the way, that we're, we're people too, by the way. So what do we do here? Well, let me use the first point today as an illustration for the rest, if, I'm, if I might. Number one today, we have a Savior. What He did for us. Notice, if you would, Romans 5. <clears throat> in verse number 8. But God commendeth His love. What does it mean He commended His love? That means He demonstrated His love. And that love was sacrificial in nature in sending the Lord Jesus Christ. But God commendeth His love toward us in that while we were yet what? Sinners. That's our condition. We're sinners. Okay, we're sinners by nature, we're sinners by action, and without God's help, without God's intervention, we go out into eternity lost, because we have no way to deal with our sin. We want to be able to do that. What else do we have here? But God commended His love toward us, our condition, and why we're not sinners, and what's the consequence? Christ died for us. Great was the day when each of us embraced the truth, the honest truth, that we were sinners. You cannot be saved until you get lost. But I want you to know how we embraced it. Verse 1 in chapter 5. Therefore being justified, that is being made righteous, by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into His grace. By faith. I have a, um, a, a tractor at home, a 72 International, that um, I, I spend time with uh, when I need to. And uh, uh, it's funny, when I go to get up into that tractor... I've got to put my foot up, grab a hold of the steering wheel, um, or the wheel itself, and I've got to step up into that thing. You know what I'm saying? Okay? Well, that's sort of what happened when I got saved. How about you? There is truth here. What is the truth? I'm a sinner. Christ died for me. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord but shall be saved. And what we did one day when we realized who we were and we realized what He did is we stepped into that truth. We stepped into the truth that Christ died for us. That whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. By faith. Did we not do that? Amen. Did we not step into that by faith? And when we did that, instantly Christ saved us. Nothing I had to do Nothing you had to do uh, past that. Christ saved us by faith on the basis of His sacrifice. We exercise repentance toward God and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. I think we would all agree with that. Now go with me to 1 Corinthians 1 and 30. Just a few pages over, 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. We're going to look at number two, sanctification, what He does in us. Our, our Savior, what He did for us, sanctification, what He does in us. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30. I want you to note, everybody have it? Notice what it says, But of Him are ye in 
Christ Jesus. We're saved. We're in Christ Jesus. Who of God and from God, if you would, Christ, once we're saved, we're in Christ, has been made unto us. He provides for us. Part of who he is is wisdom to us and righteousness to us. We're justified in sanctification to us and redemption to us. So when I am in Christ, he says, you're sanctified. So positionally, when I get saved and you get saved, the Lord comes in, he puts us in Jesus Christ, and we are, we are holy. We are set apart unto God on the basis of Christ's work. Okay? That's a one-time thing. We're, we're put into Christ. However, we live in this world, and we are called to Holiness. We're called to sanctification. We're called to walking with Christ. We're talk. We're, we're 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 called to change. If you do, and that's what He is to do in us. Turn with me to Romans eight. I've said this once or twice before. I will never finish this message. Okay, Romans eight. Notice it, if you would please, and verse one. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. If you're in Christ, that means when God the Father looks down, He doesn't see you as a sinner. He sees you in Christ, and Christ's payment has paid for you. Okay, and, and what you have done. So notice now... No condemnation to them which are in Jesus Christ who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. Down, if you would please, from verse number four, um, that the righteousness of the law might be filled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the what? Spirit. Spirit. But they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Okay? Verse 11, But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus Christ from the dead dwell in you. And it does. Verse number 12, Therefore, brethren, Christians, those at Emmanuel Baptist Church today that know the Lord, we are debtors not to live to the flesh, but after, I'm sorry, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh, but to live, if, or if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do what? Mortify the deeds of the body ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit. Now this is a mouthful. Okay? Here is the great struggle we were talking about in the beginning of the message. Here we are, we're redeemed, we name Christ as our Savior, we do that, and yet we seem to be without joy, and we seem to struggle with our walk with Christ I could go a little further in the message and say we are to bear fruit. Galatians 5, as Christians, we have that responsibility. All of those things, and it seems like we're struggling so much to do that. Here is the principle I, 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 I want to share with you. Learn this. If, if you get this, it is life changing. The same way I used faith, faith given me of God, I exercised faith, repentant faith, to step into my salvation, right? I exercised faith. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I, ex I took that, I stepped into it by faith. What we seem to be missing is that same Christ has been provided for us and is to us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification. What do you mean, Pastor? In the same way you let Jesus be your Savior by faith, you need to live your life that way. So in other words, I get up and I have all these responsibilities. And I get up and I'm saying, Lord, today... I have service responsibilities, and I, I, I need to be sanctified. I need to walk with you, and 
uh, Lord, I, I need you to be my shepherd. What, we, what we're missing is we're using faith as a realm to talk about our salvation, but we are not using the faith that Christ has given us to be able to let him live through us. When I get up in the morning, let me illustrate it again, like I stepped into the tractor, I can get up and say, Lord, today I need you to be my everything. By faith, I'm stepping in this by faith. I'm asking you to be my holiness today. By faith, I'm asking you to be my service today. By faith, I'm asking you to shepherd me today. And by faith, I'm stepping into that understanding that I am called to live not a Christian life, but a Christ life. And when I begin to step into that, a lot of things begin to happen. Number one, I understand when it comes to my mind, my mouth, my motives, my money, every, everything involved in my Christian life, I have now asked by faith Jesus Christ to begin to control that. It is amazing the burden that lifts. You see, because when you're saved and you know Christ and you have these responsibilities that you have to deal with and you're trying to do them all yourself and you're trying to line it up and I've got to be at church and, um, you know, I've got to do this and I've got to do that and a Christian should do this and a Christian should do that. Is that not exhausting? And we lose our joy. We lose our victory. And most of the time we lose most of the battles. You know, why, why can't we live in victory once in a while? Why can't we live in joy once in a while? I, I, I'm, I'm here to tell you that the same way that married couple I was just talking about, we, we come together, who is going to do the meals? Do you understand that the Lord has provided, if you would, He has provided the meal, He has brought it there, but you're responsible to put it in the oven and turn it on. Okay, He has provided the gifts and the abilities and the home and the place to take care of the baby, but you've got to exercise a little effort yourself. The husband and wife, though, have faith in the marriage. Like we should have faith in Christ in the same way you allow Jesus Christ to be your Savior. You need by faith to allow him to live his life through you. Quit doing it yourself. Yes, amen. No wonder Christians walk around as if their closest friend is the latest persimmon tree they hugged. My, I, I, I'm not going to go through this. I don't have time. Can I simply just say, uh, the, the, turn with me to John 15. I'll just highlight this. John chapter 15. Notice John 15 and verse 5. We're going to have John 15 and verse 5. Jesus is speaking here. He said, I am the vine. He's an illustration. And ye are the branches. You come off of the vine. He that abideth in me like a branch abides in the vine. If the branch is broke, it's going to die. But if the branch is attached to the vine, it can bring forth fruit. Okay, he that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. The same principle. How do I bear fruit in my Christian life? How do I bring forth peace, joy, love? All right, and certainly we're not going to do that perfectly. But, but how do I live a Christian life that has some fruitfulness to it? You first start by stopping and getting on your knees and saying, God, I can't do it. Amen. 
And just like you came to Christ for salvation and exercised faith, you need to exercise that same faith and say, Lord, you're made unto me wisdom. You have made unto me sanctification. In other words, you'll do it through me if I submit myself and say, I want to live a Christ life today. Dear God, you do it through me. Okay? Just like me stepping up into that tractor. Step into the faith. Step into the truth that the Lord has given you. Step into those things if you would. Turn with me and we'll, we'll close to Joshua chapter number 7. Joshua chapter number 7. Joshua number 7. Joshua 7 is an interesting passage. Joshua, Moses has died. Joshua has led the children of Israel into the land of Canaan. He's there. They have went and they have defeated Jericho. Now they're about to go up to Ai. But just before they're to go up, we have this verse of Scripture in chapter 7, Joshua 7, and verse 1. And it says this, But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerai, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. Now what happened here? God is saying when they went up and they took the city, everything, all the gold and silver, everything there is mine, bring it into my treasury. There are other times that they took nations, and the Lord said, it's all yours. But this time, he said, this is set apart for me. There is a man that went out and took gold and silver and garments and went back and hid it in his tent. If, if you would, he went down to the post office and deposited it, right, in one of, one of those boxes, as it were. And God said, this is wrong. So here is Joshua. Now, they don't know this has happened, and the rest of the kingdom, and notice what they're going to do. Now, notice, here they are, and Joshua sent men, verse 2, from Jericho to Ai. I'm, I'm highlighting here. Uh, they returned to Joshua, verse 3, and said, Let not all the people go up, only about two or 3,000 go. Why? Because there's no big deal, we can take the city. Well, they get up there, verse 5, and the men of Ai smote them, and 36 men die. Verse 6, now notice it. And Joshua rent his clothes, and fell on the earth upon his face, the ark of the Lord, unto the eventide, he and the elders of Israel, and put dust upon their heads. They're there all day. God doesn't answer. He said, what's wrong? Verse 7, And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, therefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites, to destroy us. Would to God we had been content and dwelt on the other side of Jordan. And the Lord, O Lord, what shall I say when Israel turneth their backs and runs? Verse 10, and the, it's like the Lord is a little exasperated, and he's just waiting, shaking his head. And verse 10 he says, And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up, wherefore thou liest on thy face. Israel has sinned. He's saying, hey, you, You've spent hours on your face here, and I'm just waiting and waiting. I've been the God that's been behind you the whole time, and you think I've just forsaken you? You think I, I, I've just... And it's like God is saying... Can I, can I put it kindly? Joshua, get a life. I'm here. I've always been here. Nothing's changed except for you. What are you doing on your face? Don't you understand? Israel hath sinned. And that's why I took my blessing away. And you couldn't defeat that city of Ai. Now, can I say to us, that I believe sometimes the Lord is the same way with us. 
we're saying, oh God, where are you? And, and Lord, this is so hard, and life is so horrible, and why is this happening and that happening? You have no joy. You have nothing in your life. And God's sitting up there saying, what are you doing on your face? I have provided for you. But you aren't using me to live your life. You're using you to live your life. Quit using you to live your life. You're not going to have victory. <clears throat> the most miserable Christians in the world <clears throat> are the ones who have been saved and are living the Christian life in their own strength. Amen. And by the way, if you're here and you're a believer and you've been disillusioned in your faith, that you know, I don't know where God is. I don't know why this happened in my life. I don't understand it. Could it be that the Lord saved you and what's happened is you've not went back and, and got the resources that you needed that He has provided for you to live the Christian life? If you would, it's like pulling into a gas station, you're out of gas, and you're standing there beside the gas tanks and you're fussing at God because you're out of gas. And the Lord's saying, just put it in. You follow me here? Just put it in. The same faith that you exercised, that you stepped into when you asked Christ by faith to save you, believed His Word. He wants you to use that same faith now as you live your lives every day. Every day. And by the way, I don't believe you have to go through and say, Lord, be my service and be my sanctification and help me to bear fruit and help me with my mouth and help me with this and help me with that. No, no, no. I think if you simply go ahead and say, Dear God, by faith I give you my life and by faith help me to live a Christ life today. By faith every avenue of my life would you just take over? Would you work through me? That doesn't mean it's all going to be perfect. Um, um, here I am. Yesterday I, I run out to Home Depot and I'm getting a, a can of paint that I needed. And I, I'm in a hurry and I had some cardboard in my back seat. I put the paint on it. I had to stop here at church. I opened up the door. Here comes the can of paint. And guess what? With the nice plastic lids. There's a green spot out there. Okay. I was going to blame that on Pastor Luke, but he's not here, so. Okay. All right. That doesn't mean stuff is not going to happen. Of course it is. But I'm here to tell you, you can live in a whole lot more victory than what you're living. You can live with a whole lot more joy than what you're having. You can have Christ be more real to you than what He is. But it's simply a, a, just let go and consciously allow the Lord, submit to Him to live His life through you. Come home, married, first day, the job, she's out in the garden, and you walk in, and you say, we're supper. God never intended that. Never did. Let's pray. Lord, now take your word today and use it in our hearts and our lives, I pray. Um, God, we need your help. We need your help. We need your help. We need your help so much. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I, I wonder if you're here and you say, I'm a Christian pastor. I know Christ is my Savior. But boy, I haven't been letting, by faith, I haven't been living my life or letting Him live it through me. I've been struggling. I've been struggling with my joy, with my mouth, with my mind, with my motives. So many areas I've been struggling with. Today I surrender all of that. I surrender all of that today and I'm asking Jesus Christ to live His life through me. Let me see your hands. You're holding your hands up today. I'm, I'm praying that way right now. I'm praying that way right now. So many, many hands. God bless you today. Pray through about that. Make this something that you do every day. 
as you give your life to the Lord. Secondly, you're here today and you say, Pastor Robert, I have a desire for spiritual things, but the fact is I don't know if I've ever been saved. I don't know if something were to happen to me and I went out into eternity that I'd go to heaven when I die. I don't know that for sure. Boy, I'd sure like to pray for you today. As those other people raise their hand, would you be willing just between me, you, and God to raise your hand and say, Pastor, pray for me. I'm not sure about my relationship with Him. I'm not sure about my salvation. I want to be. I'm not sure. Would you just hold your hand up? I can pray for you today. Pastor Reverend, I'm not sure. Would you just do that? Now, Lord Jesus, thank you for your watch, care, and love in each of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me, heads bowed, eyes closed? This is the invitation. There's something you need to pray about, you need to get on your knees about. All right, Lord, live your life through me. I am so tired of this dry world. I, I am so tired of living without joy. I'm so tired of going through the motions. I am so tired of it. God has spoken. Would you just step out and come? Step out and come right now, right, right to the front. Dear God, I am so tired of this. 